the various uh, party units throughout the country would pick out the best potential leaders. You know, they had them from the uh, marine workers, you know, from the waterfront. They had longshoremen, they had teamsters, they had textile, they had rubber. In other words, they would pick out the best potential person or, 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 or male or female who could be developed into a good leader by going to school. There were about 60 students and uh, about six of us were picked out as had to have special tutelage because first of all we came from the mills they came from the mines and just to sit in a classroom for five six hours we couldn't absorb anything and I we would I would fall asleep in my position at that time to find out that I was picked out you know to go to national training school there was enormous responsibility given to me that I gotta learn I mean, God damn it, Stanley, you get in there and then no matter how high it is, stay there and read and oh, oh, oh. Well, the tutor that was my tutor fell in love with me, I guess working closely with me or something, and convinced me to marry him, but really convinced me. And some of the other students also helped to convince me. What do you mean he convinced you? That I should get married. And the two of us would make a marvelous team. And why should I go back to the mill? Which is, wow, I didn't think it was a bad idea. Why should I go? After all, I got six months training. I will now be a professional revolutionist. And why should I go back to the mill? So I figured, and besides, he was good looking and he was a good dancer. So that helped, you know. So I figured, fine, <laughs> I agreed. So right at the end of school, Ohio State Convention of the Communist Party was being held. So both of us went there and I asked what our assignments would be, since we're both trained right? Revolutionists. So they didn't know where to put us, so they suggested I go back to the mill and my husband become the section organizer and I support him. And that was the end of that. I says, I will do nothing like that. When I finished that six-week school, uh, I came out uh, marching and I was ready to go back to Harlem and start the revolution by myself. <laughs> we didn't have any identity crisis. I, I... We didn't have any worries about what was our role, what was our destiny, what individual fulfillment we were seeking for. We knew with absolute conviction that we were part of a vanguard that was destined to lead an American working class to a socialist revolution. There was just simply no question at all in your mind that who you were and what you were and why you were, what was the meaning of life, you had that answer. Dorothy joined the party when she was 14. Like many communists, she worked as a union organizer in the 1930s. Her main work was among farm laborers, whose wages and conditions were some of the worst in the country. Seen us valley, two cent cotton. I'm on picket, Lord, I'll try. God, I'm tired of picking cotton. In May of 1937, she was called in to help by striking cotton pickers in Southern California. I stayed in the home of one of the uh, field workers and I would sleep in the iron bedstead with the four children. It was a constant struggle for the barest kind of existence of living. The first thing that was done was to call a mass meeting of all participants 
husbands, wives, children, they had to learn to run that strike. They had to have the power that they could do something about their own lives if they were organized together. I would suggest that the people there describe what they considered the important issues. It would be people talking from their guts. As I looked out at that audience, there was a kind of joy. Here were people in the most desperate living conditions who had discovered what unity meant, what solidarity meant. The communication back and forth, you were one. The speaker, the strikers, there was no we and they. There was only us. I don't remember not one person ever feeling it was a sacrifice. It, we, I want to emphasize, we got more enrichment, we learned more, we acquired more ourselves than any other comparable experience could ever have given us. A lot of your questions have led me back in, through the years to what I might call my radical youth and life as a young man. And that's good. I, I sometimes think about that period. But I would not want to give anybody the impression that those were my golden years or the best years of my life, or anything like that. I see it as something that I passed through in the same way that I passed through my adolescence or my childhood. In the 1930s, Carl worked as a reporter for the Midwest Daily Record, a communist-sponsored newspaper published in Chicago. One of the stories that I covered was a strike of sharecroppers in what was called Swamp East Missouri, the area around Sykeston, Missouri. These sharecroppers had simply moved out on the highway to demonstrate their problems. They moved out, they moved all their belongings right out on the highway. Their idea was that in this way, the cars passing would somehow deliver their message to Washington or to wherever. You say that it was a dramatic story. You had described this to us before, so I got some clippings. I wanted to just read a little bit of it because I thought it All was right. really quite something. It says, Sykeston, Missouri, January 13th. Uh, sharecroppers send out a plea to smash through the terror ring of the planters with food and supplies to keep them alive. Today, these Negro and white victims counted the near dead, the sick, and the hungry. Huddled in flimsy, improvised shelters, evicted tenant farmers and their wives and kids face starvation today. On roadside fires, sizzled the last few strips of bacon and the last handful of beans. Well, it, it certainly was very dramatic for me, and, uh, and I wrote it without trying to be melodramatic, but it certainly, the, 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 the conditions that I saw there were such that I, I couldn't write it any other way. Every night, Carl wrote letters to his wife about the sharecropper's story. At the time he read them to us, he hadn't seen them in many years. All day long, I hear the talk of planters and their stooges, deputies, state troopers, bureaucratic small-time officials. And when they say nigger and nigger lover and lynch and agitator and communist, they mean violence. And all of it is directed against a few hundred mild and wonderful people, simple, quiet, intelligent, honest, loving people who are starving in a swamp. It's all too damned ominous, like something horrible were about to happen. I've been feeling this way all day. This morning, I went out to a dismal bog where the sharecroppers are. It rained continuously, and I sat in one of those excuses for a tent and talked and talked and helped to move the pans around to where the water was dripping in worst. Something sings inside of me when I'm with these people, and it runs, Arise, you wretched of the earth. I heard stories today that would make your blood freeze, and through it all ran the same. The 
the same savage depravity about a planter who whipped a sharecropper's hog to death because it was on his land, about a sharecropper who was tied to a post and flogged to death, about a little Negro boy who was starving and stole some beans and was beaten and forced to work in the field for a week to pay, pay the damage. By intervals, this thing has ripped the heart out of me and inspired me as few things ever have. The colossal guts of these people. Bucking a setup as cruel and hidebound, as ruthless and powerful as the planter autocracy. It's a story that I'll tell you for weeks if I ever get back.